Okay, what's up? So I'm going to review uh, Star Wars Episode 3 Revenge of the Sith. So I've just rewatched it again on Blu-ray. I'm actually just surprised how dark it is. It was darker than I remembered. And I, I don't know if it's... I don't know if I'm just tired, but I feel like it's affected my mood. I just feel kind of depressed. It is very... Uh, yeah, dark what happens, especially with Anakin. And anyway, I think I, I've decided... I mean... That's why I still feel mixed, but I feel like I give the movie 10 out of 10. I think it doesn't mean it's perfect, and these ratings don't really mean anything, but I was very impressed. The visuals and the action, again, I think are really good. So let's start. The opening, I think, is really, really good. Very. There's one continuous shot, um, and there's really cool music by John Williams again, with this sort of just very bare, minimal sort of boom, 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 boom. Boom, like a deep drum sort of rhythmic thing and we see like a big ship and then we sort of pan down we see these two ships and then we sort of pan across and down and we go through this force field and the shot just keeps moving and I mean I know it's sort of CGI but it's very well constructed and we get to see lots of like just an epic battle going on and uh, the music I think really suits it very well um, uh, it's just very epic, and I just thought, and then and then we basically go into a continuous 20 minutes of action that I think is, yeah, really well directed. Obviously, for something to be really good, you've got to care about the characters and stuff, um, but I think you do here. I think um, it's nice to see how they've developed from the previous films, uh, Hayden Christensen. I feel he's at um, Harry Potter 3 level, Daniel Radcliffe in Harry Potter and, say, The Prisoner of Azkaban. He still lacks the experience, I think, needed to pull off. I think Anakin Skywalker is a very hard role, and especially this movie, when you've got, like, an, you know, a director that's sort of infamous for not, you know, giving lots of direction. You need really experienced actors. I think that was the problem with a lot of the children, and some of the, I think there's some, like, Australian cast, some of them are fine, they're good actors, but some of them, there's some people that you get the impression they haven't acted a lot before, and it, it comes across. Um, but yeah, that that opening part is heaps good. The droids and uh, R2-D2, there's a lot of comedy uh, that I actually really enjoyed. I, I really like the atmosphere of that starting part. Um, it starts to get weird. It does seem a little, the way it approaches the darkness and Anakin's turn to the dark side, that's the part where I feel a bit weird. Um, I feel like it, it doesn't quite, I, I don't quite buy it. It is kind of disturbing uh, how it happens and it seems plausible-ish, but it's not completely believable. And I just feel like maybe it could have happened a different way. Here's, I'll just go into what I think uh, should, maybe would have worked better is the movie can start similarly, big action scene, um, but I think we should have really emphasized Anakin's intelligence and also his kindness, how nice he is and caring, like really passionate and caring, because that's the idea, is that, and, and, and afraid of losing Padme, afraid of um, losing Obi-Wan and stuff, but in a good way, like a really caring person. And they're also extremely powerful. I think we, it should have emphasized how powerful he was, and therefore he's a, not a threat, but the idea of the other Jedi, like even more powerful than Yoda, and then that's like a, perhaps some of the Jedi Council are a bit wary of him. Um, anyway, I just think that could be emphasized more. And then Padme, I think, I think it would have worked if she died, either, like I say, half an hour or 45 minutes into the movie, and had the twins and maybe he didn't know, he didn't find out for some reason about the kids. Maybe he knew she was pregnant, but she thinks the kids are dead. He thinks the kids are dead. And then that's the impetus. That's the, rather than his fear of her dying, I think her dying itself should have been the thing that devastated him, reminded him of his mother, made him feel completely alone. And then it should be, you know, him feeling like that and then feeling frustrated and you know, and then the Jedi is saying, like, it would have been good if her death was somehow, uh, he felt like it was the Jedi's fault for some reason, like he was off on a mission and he couldn't save her, or they made a bad decision and she got betrayed, something, and then he fights with Obi-Wan and it ends up becoming a lightsaber battle, and then Obi-Wan can sort of 
say, look, I don't want to, we don't need to fight. And then he's given no choice. Anakin's just like angry in the moment, but not on the dark side yet. But then Obi-Wan beats him and injures him. And then, and then he can get turned into Darth Vader. This is just my idea. I won't take too long. I'll get back to the movie. And then his, his Darth Vader outfit doesn't have to be the same as the one from the original trilogy. One thing that's really good with these prequels is that they have lots of spaceships and stuff that are reminiscent of things from the original trilogy, but not the same. You know, like uh, earlier versions, I guess, the prototypes. So like the, sh the big ships, the stormtroopers, um, and a lot of the other random ships and stuff. Uh, hang on. So yeah, I think, I don't know if he needed to get burnt and all that, like, but anyway, that's in the movie. Um, he gets turned into Darth Vader and has an outfit, and then at that point I think he would be furious and sort of angry at the Jedi, and then he can go, and you can, because he's already gone through pain and then had a sort of a misunderstanding that turned into a confrontation and he lost control and then got beaten by Obi-Wan, and then, then you know, is saved, and then the Emperor can manipulate him, as he does in the movie, and sort of console him, and he's the only person that seems to care, and then uh, he goes back and kills all the Jedi, and then it's more believable that he might kill children, which, I mean, that's horrific, I think that's maybe what's shaken me up, like, just the reality of that, that's, I mean, it's, honestly, I think there's not that many movies as dark as Star Wars Episode Three: <laughs> Revenge of the Sith, there are horror movies, but they're just stupid. It's just random people. Like you, they're meant to die. Having children get killed and seeing it happen. You see one child, you know, sort of a teenager. Block, block, block. It looks kind of cool and heroic, but he gets shot. And then this guy shouts, No! And, you know, and then flies away. Like, that's it's really terrible. Anyway, so that's, that's what I think. Padme should have died. That should have been... So that started, he fought, he should have been in a prototype Darth Vader outfit that's similar, but not necessarily the same, and then see him as Darth Vader come and kill all of them, and then it, we should have really seen the dark side, um, and then there can be other struggles and stuff, but as it is, I think it's good. I have to say that's uh, a week, the last 10 minutes I didn't like as much for this movie, because it, it sort of cutely sets everything up for the next for episode 4, and I think that's unnecessary, like, to do it to that degree. You've got to just have a good movie and a good ending. If you think of Star Wars going into Empire Strikes Back, it's not like they say, okay, well, let's let's go to Ice Planet Hoth now, and let's set up there, and hopefully the Empire won't attack. And at the end of episode 5, they don't say, all right, uh, let's go to Tatooine, and um, I don't know if they send R2-D2 and C-3PO, I guess they do. Um, and I'll go and save him, and then you come, and you say you're a Jedi. You know, they don't, like, we don't directly link each one, so you don't need... That's what I didn't like with him becoming Darth Vader. He says a couple of lines, and then, including the, No! I actually thought that moment... I, I don't completely like it, but I think it's sincere, you know? Um, and it's important for a director, or for filmmakers, screenwriters, whatever to make the story the way that they want to, that makes sense for the characters and whatnot. And I think those lines are kind of weird, but I think they knew, you know, Darth Vader saying, where's Padme? Um, is she safe? I saw her alive. How can this, that's impossible. But I feel like that fits with the character. It sort of makes sense. I just, but there's just elements of that um, transition that I don't think completely work, they're not completely convincing. Um, so yeah, I was just saying, seeing Darth Vader, I, I think it was pointless. You, you want to see him do stuff, so seeing him dress up like, I'm in my Darth Vader outfit, look at me, aren't I cute? Look, I got the black and the, I just didn't see the point. I'd prefer if they left it out and just let it be a, you know, we know what happens later on. It's unnecessary. Um, and it just seems funny that he's wearing the exact same suit for all those years, and I guess he must wash it. Um, that's why I think a prototype would have made more sense. Um, and 
And it's also funny, there's like a guy that looks, I guess, like Moff Tarkin, or the guy that plays that. You sort of see, it's kind of nice, but I just thought it was a bit silly. They just sort of seemed to imitate all the things, and they had Tatooine. But that, that did, I did find that kind of moving, when they got Luke, um, and they're both, they're sort of looking out at the suns. But I just think it's a bit unnecessary. It's not as good as if Episode 3 had a big ending, and just sort of ended abruptly when it needed to end rather than sort of having these cute tie-ins. Tie Alright, let's move on. Um, yeah, I think the uh, the special effects are really good. The, I really like the dinosaur thing, the like, feathery animal that uh, Obi-Wan's riding, and General Grievous is very cool. I think, I don't know if it's written here, but I think Gary Oldman does the voice of um, uh, General Grievous. I have to look it up. Anyway, he's like one of my favorite actors, and I really like, I do like General Grievous. I find him funny. He's an effective villain for what he needs to be, and it's hilarious that he has a cough. <laughs> uh, there's a part where he sort of laughs. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess he's got these sort of weird internal organs, so that's why it's as if he's come from a, a real person, or he's partially organic. Um, but yeah, it's hilarious that he can be sick. And I thought the stuff with him, you get the impression he's sort of been trained by Dooku, but not properly. He's not like a Sith, he's just picked up some lightsaber things. So it's just kind of cool, he's got the four, and then he's true, 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 and naturally everyone eventually partially disarms him. But I think the action scenes work really well. And the locations, I just think, are amazing in this movie. That, the really sad bit when, you know, execute order 66 i mean that affected me as well there's a few parts where i was fine with crying i have a lot of control so it's up to me if i want to let myself let that single tear do go down or not but it it affected me the um and the music's really nice the da da na 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 da na 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 da 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 it's it's hard to um sing there's a lot of sort of uh, slightly atonal music and very um tense music in this movie a lot of chords that aren't quite you know there's a lot of tension in it and um i think this is the most exotic score by John Williams for the Star Wars uh, movies, all six, well, not including the really crappy one, um, <laughs> The Force Awakens. Um, yeah, it's got some sort of weird bits, I guess, like the immolation scene is really, really uh, messed up, the, how does the music go for that, I don't know, there's some weird organ stuff, um, there's some weird Volo singing when they're at the uh, sort of uh, uh, the opera sort of house thing and there's the big bubbles that they're watching um, just to create mood I suppose and when Natalie Portman and Anakin Skywalker are looking sort of pensive and thinking of each other um, and this is sort of when he's told Mace Windu about like, that's the thing. He, he sort of does the right thing. He finds out that, you know, this guy is the Sith Lord. Tells Mace Windu, and then Mace Windu says, no, you should just sit. At that point, everything is good. And then that, that part is clearly the turning point. Those words are in his mind, and he just sees Padme dying and doesn't want it. He's desperate to stop it, desperate to do anything. And he doesn't have a plan, but I think he just goes impulsively. And then just sort of split second, he says, "No, you can't just kill him. He's the my only chance." And then, and then I think he seriously feels like, "Oh my God, what have I done?" But then it's after that that where he just says, "I'll do anything." And then uh, Palpatine just says, or whatever the Emperor says, like, "Ah, oh, you know, this guy knew about it. Maybe we can discover the skill of bringing a person or keeping a person alive." And that's. I don't know, so, but look, I think the movie works, like, all the parts are pretty well done, I think it's one of the hardest things to actually portray someone turning to evil, um, but I think, like, I think maybe The Godfather sort of shows that with, um, Al Pacino, uh, but, 
Um, I, I like the idea of the Dark Knight, what happens with Harvey Dent. I, that's what I think should have happened. At the start of the movie, he's just a really good, caring person, and then just Padme just dies, and it feels like it's other people's faults, and like, why did they... She could have been alive, and it's your fault, and then he fights, and then he, he gets injured, and then he becomes Darth Vader, and then he just goes berserk and kills everyone. Um... Um, but yeah, that music when Anakin's thinking and you can see Padme, that it's like weird music, like sort of Arabic or Middle Eastern, like ah, uh, 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 I don't know, I have no idea. Um, like it's just sort of interesting that John Williams is doing new things, and I think the film is actually very, uh, like it's sort of artistic in that way. It's not just doing what you want to see the easy, it's not taking the easy road, it's really dwelling on these themes. And it's, it's very dark, it's very, um, it reminds me of Macbeth a bit as well. Although I don't like Macbeth, and that's partially what I don't like about this either. The logic, like as in because he, he sort of causes the death of Padme when he, because he sort of force chokes her, and then at the end they sort of said she's lost the will to live. And I'm pretty sure that can happen, like with, like sort of what happened with his mother, Shmi Skywalker. Um, you know, people that are dying, sometimes they can hold on for a bit longer and then they can sort of let go. Or I just, I don't know. My mum has more experience with that, with being a nurse and, and stuff. But I think there's truth to that. When someone loses the will to live, sometimes it's just, you know, they die when they might have lived otherwise. Um, and she was choked, so that, but yeah, the way he sort of causes the problem because of his anticipation of it. Macbeth is told these things by witches, and then he sort of does actions to make it happen. Um, I, now, something I really like in the movie, I think Ian McDiarmid is really good as the emperor. And I haven't really mentioned him, like he's a, a very good actor, and I think I've also got to give a shout out to Frank Oz. He's... Voice work, I think, is very, very good for Yoda. Very consistent, and Yoda has a much bigger role. In fact, Yoda and the Emperor, we both we get to see both of them really in action a lot more than we've ever seen them before. And I think that's really cool and exciting. Like, that's a... Um, yeah, I just think that's interesting. And, I mean, it's totally different from the original trilogy. Yoda doesn't have to use a lightsaber to be cool, but it is nice to see that, and I think they did it with dignity, and they... They tried to do it the best way they could, in a way that makes a lot of sense. Um, it would have been... I don't think it's an easy task, and I think they did a very good job. Um, but yeah, Ian McDiarmid does some weird... Like, faces when he's... Yeah, fighting Mace Windu and stuff. And I just... Some of the... I really liked his lines that he says to um, uh, Anakin. Uh, the story about Darth Plagueis, I really liked. And uh, his voice sometimes going a bit deeper. But I think it's believable that, like, some people would critique, like, it's obvious that he's Palpatine, the Emperor. But you've got to realize the good guys never see the Emperor. We only see Palpatine, and we're aware there might be some kind of Sith Lord or something in the background. But I don't think the good guys ever see him. And the nature of the dark side is to cloud things, to hide things, shadows and... Um, that sort of thing. Um, it, yeah, the dark side clouds everything. Um, and I think he's very good at just, uh, when he's Palpatine, it's like he's, it's like in Dragon Ball Z, his power level is turned down, so they don't detect any power. Like, uh, Goku's able to sort of hide his power level, I think, in some episodes. Whatever, but if that makes sense. They don't, they're, they're sort of suspicious of Palpatine, but... There's no, they have no evidence, and it would be difficult, you know, you need, I guess, a warrant, um, or something. The Jedi are just peacekeepers, so, um, so another thing I want to mention is the sound is really good. The sound of that dragon thing, the sounds it makes, the, and the, the circle that General Grievous, uh, sort of the gear wheel thing that he goes on. In fact, there's a lot of vehicles, like on the Wookiee planet, whatever, I forget what it's called, and some of the other places, just there's all kinds of cool vehicles that someone's taken the time to design, and you get to see it in motion, and you get these cool camera things, 
um, as it happens. When the execute order 66 is happening and we see all the different uh, Jedi getting killed, again, that really moved me, especially I think when it's the blue alien lady and they just sort of step back and just shoot her. It's horrific. Most of the Jedi, they sort of just realize they're like in shock or frozen for a second and then they defend themselves. Each of them, they last like a few seconds and then they're dead. It's just, yeah, it's crazy, the betrayal and the fact that it, it seems clear that Palpatine planned this all way in advance. It was a huge uh, plan. That I, I don't know who Cypher Dias is. I need to look that up. Um, or if that was, maybe it was done in Cypher Dias' name, but not actually done by him. Um, anyway. Uh, but yeah, I think I actually understood the the overall arching plan that Palpatine had. So to, he starts, he's playing both sides basically. A little bit actually reminds me of um, for A Fistful of Dollars, or I should say Yojimbo. Yo, uh, was it Yojimbo? Um, or Yojimbo, whatever. Uh, a Japanese movie by Akira Kurosawa. This samurai sort of plays, there's a town and there's two sides and he sort of says, oh, how much will you pay me to help? And then they said, they sort of getting them to bid against each other, which side, trying to gain from it. Anyway, it's just like a classic movie. Um, it just, yeah, it feels like he's sort of using both sides against each other. So he has the Trade Federation sort of occupying Naboo over some silly dispute. And then, you know, Naboo needs more help and Amidala wants more help and then he sort of says, well, you know, there's all this bureaucracy, if only there was a way, and then they, um, you know, they end up re-voting to get a new senator, and then he becomes the senator. Um, I actually think it was a pretty well-planned-out thing, like, and it's an interesting way to really learn how he became the emperor. I can see prequels being very different, but this is, I think it's kind of cool to get a real insight into how he did it. So he... Let me try and understand this, explain it properly. Um, so yeah, oh yeah, so they sort of vote, oh this Chancellor is no good because he's not taking action. And then they end up, he gets sort of a sympathy vote, he ends up being the Chancellor. And he says, I will take action. And then, um, I guess into the sequel, there's sort of, there are people that side with the Trade Federation and think, I don't know, it's unfair or they're just following the law. and. Palpatine sort of supporting them, or the Emperor supporting them, um, and they're making a Death Star, or there's plans for that. And then separate from that, as the Chancellor is saying, oh, you know, uh, at some stage you must have gotten the clone army, and he's, the Jedi are worried about um, the Separatists, and there's this big thing going on, and so, yeah, it's like he's creating an uprising and then saying, we need to stop it, so we need a big army. Um, a bit like... I've, I've heard theories that, like, say, 9-11 was an inside job. I don't, I don't... I'd say that's probably not the case, but it's not impossible for certain... There may be certain sort of terrorist attacks or things that happen where it's the government itself can actually cause it as a reason to then go to war. I know Japan had sort of a dodgy reason during World War Two or before in the early 30s to fight somewhere in China or Manchuria over a bridge or something. I must sound like a complete idiot. But like it's it's where like a little skirmish gets sort of made into a big thing and then becomes the reason. So he uses these separatists which he created or is supporting to then um, justify using this huge clone army and getting the Jedi to go on a war. Um, and then I guess at the right time, he gets his new Anakin, who, and, and when he tells the story about Darth Plagueis, I, I really liked that bit, it made perfect sense. Obviously, or it seems implied, Darth Plagueis was his uh, master, who he learnt from, and um, it makes sense that Anakin would be suspicious, but he hasn't revealed himself yet, because for all Anakin knows, he's just... Um, interested in the Force, and he's read on, up on it, and he's learnt about dark Sith Lords from the past, or he, he was interested in it. But it's implied Darth Plagueis was his master, and that he killed him, and, um, what was I trying to say? 
Yeah, you mentioned the potential to keep someone alive, uh, save someone, but also the potential to like impregnate someone or whatever out of nowhere. And it's implied that this prophecy, which... I mean, that's the thing. I don't know why you would ever believe in a prophecy. Like, you can't justify it. It's But it's so common. It's always the one, like in the Matrix, Harry Potter, there's a prophecy. I feel like a lot of fiction... Um, uh, but yeah, I, th I think it's sort of unhealthy, this idea of the one that will bring balance to the Force. Um, but it, what seems actually happened was that Pal uh, em the Emperor made Shmi have a baby, he, his next apprentice that he wanted to teach. I guess just as a pawn, he's trying to just be in charge and be in charge forever. Um, I'm not clear on when he gets zapped like Mace Windu uses the lightsaber to reflect his electricity. I don't, I'm not sure if that's revealing how old he is or if he got hurt. I think it's revealing how old he really is. Somehow some facade has gone away. Or, yeah, and maybe he's allowing himself to look old to say, Mace Windu did this to me, they attacked me. Um, you know, and use that as further justification for total control. And then once the Jedi are uh, wiped out, like Natalie Portman has a line about, so this is how uh, liberty is destroyed or something. Democracy turns into dictatorship, you know, to a rousing applause, um, something like that. Um, but yeah, so he must have created Anakin for his own purposes. And the whole thing, I think, with Anakin's transition makes more sense with that. Anakin is this powerful, really nice little boy in the middle of nowhere, um, and he has fears and apprehensions and skills, and maybe there is somehow a bit of darkness in him, built in, if he was created by Darth Sidious. Um, but then, yeah, it's more convincing if Darth Sidious is just this, is messing up, messing around with Anakin, uh, that makes his transition more convincing. Not only is he a bit unstable and his mother's died and then he's worried about his wife dying, so he's got the fear. Um, and there is tension with the Jedi Council. They can sense something's going on and they also don't completely trust Anakin. They don't trust the, can the Chancellor, but the Chancellor's really friendly with Anakin. And then the Chancellor's super manipulative. That stuff just... He's just feeding him. That stuff I thought worked really well. Again, I think Ian McDiarmid is uh, really good in that role. Um, they keep sort of saying, they asked you to spy on me, didn't they? And he's like, uh, I don't know what to say. And they're like, it's, it's all right, you know. Um, and then saying, the dark side is the way to save Padme. He just co kind of keeps repeating it. Because it's like he knows that will work. And there's a few interesting lines where um, Anakin says, like, I can't live without Padme, and it's it's kind of convincing. I think a lot of people can relate to that, where you feel like your life would be empty without a, a certain person. And I think that's, that's a... I think what Yoda says about you don't want to be... It's almost like a Buddhist thing, or maybe like a monk, or maybe some other religions that are similar. Or I think of a samurai. Samurai code, it's like you accept you are dead. You're going to die one day or something. I don't know if that's... Anyway, but I think it's important to accept, you no, know, people are going to die. You can't rely on anyone for your uh, drive, your passion in life, your happiness and your purpose. But anyway, I guess that's the reality is a lot of people really do feel strongly about someone. Um, and I'm not saying you can't feel lost, but like when Yoda feels lost when all the Jedi die, and then of course he hears them and stops them. Anyway, look, I just, I think it's a really good movie. There's lots of uh, little references to other things. Uh, Yoda's ship is a lot like E.T.'s, and it's cool that Chewbacca's in the movie. Um, I forgot to mention from episode 2, Attack of the Clones, I love when Jango walks into his ship and bangs his head, the thing comes down. <laughs> in reference to what happens in Star Wars, where the the guy bumps his head. That's one of my favorite bits. I forget how far into the movie, maybe 40 minutes or something, but it's, uh, I love that bit. And just the idea that, yeah, he's the, 
the, the clone that gets used for all the uh, stormtroopers, so that's why they bump their head. Um, and it is cool the way Obi-Wan looks quite a lot like Obi-Wan from Episode 4. They really set people up. I like Leia's, uh, Padme's hair at the start of the movie, similar to Leia's, the buns. And what I like about the movie is it doesn't draw, like, lots of attention to these things. They're just sprinkled out there. I think in Episode 2 as well, you can see the Millennium Falcon um, in one bit. And I spotted a lot of these things just watching it. So I think um, that's, uh, again, I'm kind of just uh, crapping on The Force Awakens. They're just still trying to make fun of how bad it is. But that's the way I think it should be done. I think the prequels did that sort of thing really good. Having their own story, lots of crazy new things happening. And nice references to the original trilogy without it being distracting. Um, another weakness I did think there was is there's a lot of uh, talking, a lot of, um, like people have said, standing and talking, walking and talking. But I think I forgot to mention this in, in the Attack of the Clones one, but I don't get it. Like, if you look at a lot of movies, The Godfather, there's a lot of standing and talking, walk, like sitting and talking. You know what I mean? Uh, a lot of classic movies. So it's a bit confusing. It's like people want action and excitement. And they also want story, but then they, like, I can get it. You want things happening and people say lines as stuff develops. And you don't want too much of a pattern. I, I do sort of feel parts of uh, Revenge of the Sith were a bit like a soap opera, where you've got characters talking to each other and then looking away, and, you know, facing or saying something and looking away. And then they're like, there's one person facing this way, and there's one person behind them talking to them. Uh, you know, like uh, the days of their life, of our, li of our lives or something. Okay, I'm back. Don't worry, I just had to go on the phone. That's weird, it felt like eight minutes to me, but it feels like nothing for you. Um, okay, so John Williams is an awesome composer. Right? I know I keep mentioning him, but something I wanted to say is... As a, like, a director has to work with all these different people. And I get the impression George Lucas, uh, you know, was very... Uh, like, had a good relationship with John Williams. That's the impression I get. I mean, John Williams did all of the Star Wars movies and kept coming back. I'm pretty sure he said this early... The original trilogy were among his favourite movies um, to do scores for. Because he really liked the movies. So, and I think that, that makes for much better music if you really care about it. I think um, Bernard Herrmann once said something like, you can sort of, uh, you can make an okay movie, you can sort of sprinkle stuff on the movie and make it nicer, but you can't actually make a good movie out of nothing. Like, um, But anyway, I, I get the impression George Lucas really respects John Williams and knows how to use uh, the music effectively. And again, I really like the cinematography, the way uh, things are set out. The, the big problem is... Um, still a bit too much talking. There's a lot of awkwardness. There was a part where, um, you know, Obi-Wan says how he saw Anakin kill younglings and he took his hand up and it, it just felt a bit awkward, a bit weird. And again, Natalie Portman, I don't like her as much when she's just sort of standing there and then sort of crying and stuff. I don't think she's bad, but it's just... Um, there's something about it, and it hinges on Anakin, and I just think you need a mature, a really experienced actor. And Hayden Christensen, I think, does an okay job, but not not brilliant. And yeah, I don't know, I actually, I just, I find the movie a bit dark. It's such a downer, but I did find it moving, and there is hope, obviously. It sort of implies, you know, it's going, the story's heading towards Star Wars, and then what happens in those ones which I'm keen to watch, so, um, but yeah, the action is brilliant, I really enjoyed it, R2-D2 is very funny, and, um, the, the way it plays out, I don't know, and the story, yeah, right from the start to the end, I found it very engaging, that's why I feel I should give it just 10 out of 10, because it's a, a satisfying movie that lives up to, I think, the standard of Star Wars, I think it was the only prequel that people sort of uh, had the guts to sort of say it's as good as the original trilogy and people didn't bite their heads off for saying that uh, people seem to give it reasonable amount of respect 
and yeah, so I think it deserves it. So anyway, uh, I'll leave it there rather than going forever. So, okay, bye.